Rick, if you can come in on what your treatment objectives are with managing patients with the small molecule inhibitors, particularly ibrutinib in this case. What do you look for? What do you want to achieve? Well, you know, right now, in the absence of data identifying that it's safe to discontinue these agents, my goal really is just progression-free survival. And one of the things that I think that's very interesting and very important to keep in mind when we discuss the data surrounding uh, BCR antagonists is this phenomenon of MRD negative partial responses. So, you know, we're collecting a lot of patients who have lymph nodes 2 to 2.5 centimeters in size radiographically, but their MRD status in the blood and bone marrow are negative. And, you know, so ultimately these would be probably CRs, but the data for really how well they're going to do is going to show up in PFS. Now, the important question will be whether or not these are patients who need to be on B-cell receptor antagonists forever, or whether or not discontinuing them at some point is actually feasible. And we do have some trials that are currently being undertaken. Peter Hillman in the United Kingdom will try to address that using um, MRD after six months, or MRD on three successive occasions over six months, as the endpoint to deciding who to then randomize to discontinue versus continuing therapy. So for now, the ultimate endpoint always is going to be progression-free survival and improvement of side effects. And until we have more data, it's continuing the therapy indefinitely. One of the fortunate aspects that we see with these B-cell receptor antagonists is that we're not making our patients into excellent day gamma globulinemia patients. So they're not developing the infections, they're not suffering from really a shutdown of B-cell production. And that's a very interesting feature, arguing for differences between, you know, kinase dead mutants versus, you know, the absence of the structural protein. And these data come from the earlier studies with 1102, where we actually see fewer infections in patients the longer they're on ibrutinib. And so as we get more and more of those data, I think the comfort level with continuing the therapies long term will improve. And what about hypogammaglobulinemia? Are patients yeah. receiving replacement for hypogammaglobulinemia? Uh, and is that improving with uh, ibrutinib therapy or? So the hypogammaglobulinemia is really, you know, it is part of CLL. You know, we talk about maybe 75 to 80 percent of CLL patients having hypogammaglobulinemia. The thing that I find very intriguing and I really, you know, have to caution people on just using IVIG replacement therapy for hypogammaglobulinemic patients, is that I have some patients with IgG levels of 50 and 75 who have never had an infection. And they're fine, and it intrigues me that patients with immunoglobulin levels of 500, you know, can suffer tremendously from repeated infections. So I do use IVIG therapy based upon the clinical criteria that were published back in the 70s, you know, identifying, you know, life-threatening infections or recurrent symptomatic infections as really the only indication, regardless of the immunoglobulin level. Now, getting back to your question, what's interesting is we do see an increase in IgA levels, or we have seen so far in the patients from the phase two ibrutinib data. And of course, Ig. A, even though it's not that high in the blood, is the most turned over immunoglobulin since most of it gets secreted. And whether or not that little uptick that we see with IgA is sort of the early signs of repairment of the immune system will remain to be seen. How about secretory IgA? Has anybody looked at secretory IgA? I'm levels? not aware of anyone looking at that yet. Dr. Ma, what about long-term side effects of ibrutinib? Patients, you spoke of, uh, mentioned about risk, increased risk for bleeding, some atrial fibrillation that has seen. We're seeing patients now that have been ibrutinib for several years. Are, are there things that we're worried about now long-term in terms of toxicity? Right, so, other than the ones that you've mentioned already. Right. So it's interesting. So if you look at the three-year follow-up on the phase two study of uh, single-agent ibrutinib in uh, relapsed refractory CLL, um, actually most of the um, concerns for, for example, cytopenia and infection have declined over time, uh, whereas the other risks, such as atrial fibrillation and bleeding risk, did not seem to increase over time. So those seem to stay steady. Uh, so I don't, I didn't see any increasing of any adverse events over time uh, on any of those issues I mentioned before. 
the frontline study on the early did, uh, that is going to be presented uh, of Ibrutin versus Chlorambus, it did mention that especially in an elderly population, there tend to be an increase in blood pressure level. And therefore, even if it's not to the point, it's usually a grade two or three, even if it's not at the point that you need to discontinue the brutinib therapy, though you need to readjust at times your blood pressure medication. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the patients on a brutinib tend to experience some weight gain, and that also needs to be seen in the context of uh, making sure that their medications are properly adjusted. So I think, you know, the importance of talking about the long-term effects of ibrutinib really are just very important from the perspective of currently it looks like these are going to be therapies patients are going to be on long-term. And in terms of the, the toxicities, you know, we do see the bruising and we do see the bleeding almost immediately upon initiation of therapy. You know, fortunately, I think the diarrhea could often be mitigated by administering the pill at night before bedtime and not eating afterwards or often it just resolves on its own after a couple of months of therapy. What's interesting is we do see the emergence of atrial fibrillation and it's still unclear whether or not there's a plateau. So whether or not this is something that's an early phenomenon that once you're through a, a year of therapy, you're gonna not be at risk or whether or not the risk will continually increase. With regard to the, the, emer the bleeding does look like it actually gets better later on and whether or not this is because the changes in the platelet in terms of tech kinase and BTK, or whether or not it's just the improvement in the marrow allows for increased megakaryocyte production and you know, larger platelets that can sort of compensate. Um, but then now the emergence of hypertension. So you know, the later effects are intriguing, and we really don't have a mechanism. And it's going to be interesting to see what else might come down the road.